we began the instruction and it was just the piece of the puzzle that was missing. You know, we started making progress in reading and spelling and her confidence grew and it was just such an exciting time. I'm Nicole Holcomb, attorney by day and podcaster by night, a former educator, school counselor and administrator and mom to a nine-year-old daughter with dyslexia who loves all things Harry Potter, Minecraft, and science. A few years ago, she was identified with dyslexia and our life seemed to turn upside down for a while and quite literally. I created the Dyslexia Mom Life podcast to help you navigate the upside down journey of dyslexia. You got this. If you're wanting to thrive as a mom in this dyslexia journey, then you're in the right place. Let's get started. Hey there, welcome back to another episode of the Dyslexia Mom Life podcast. I'm your host, Nicole Holcomb. Thank you so much for listening. I know you have a lot of options when it comes to podcasts, and the fact that you chose to listen in today means the world to me. So thanks again for being here. Today, we are continuing with our back to school mini series, all focused on thriving this school year. We start our mini series in episode nine, where I talked all about the Dear Teacher letter and video. I even shared an example of a Dear Teacher video with you in the show notes. And in episode 10, we heard all about dyslexia and anxiety from Dr. Megan Mann. She shared insights on anxiety and tips on prevention and intervention. Well, today we have Erin with us. She's the founder of the Nashville Dyslexia Center, where her mission is to provide hope and help for struggling readers by providing the very best individualized instruction by professional teachers. Erin has taught in public and private and homeschool settings and has a decade of experience tutoring students with reading challenges. On her website, she provides resources for families raising children who are struggling to learn to read. Don't worry, I will include a link to Erin's website in the show notes. You can get the show notes at dyslexiamomlife.com backslash episode 11. And that's the number, 1111. Erin is going to share with us all about her teaching experience and provide you with many school options to consider as our world is changing constantly. I can't wait for you to hear her experiences as a private teacher and tips when we are faced to learn from home yet again. After you listen to the episode, you can grab a copy of the Back to School Survival Guide for Moms to set you up to thrive this school year. Listen first and then grab the freebie. The link to the freebie is in the episode description and also on the website, dyslexiamomlife.com. We are so excited to have Erin Paskey with us today and I will not have you wait any longer. So let's meet Erin. Erin, hey, I am so excited to have you on the show today. Hi, Nicole. It is my pleasure. I am so happy to be here with you. Okay, so hi, Erin. I'm so excited to have you on the show today and I'm so glad that you are part of our Back to School mini series. For those who don't know you yet, can you just give us a quick introduction so they can get to know you better? Absolutely. And what brought you to this wonderful world of dyslexia? Well, I don't know if I can do it quickly because we've (laughs) all had a journey, it seems, to get where we are today. But I'm excited to share my story with you, Nicole, and with your listeners because I've really had an unconventional professional career in education. And I think that the sharing of my story is going to be encouraging to parents because it's been so different. We need to think creatively during this time when we're trying to educate our children. And that's what I've done. Um, And it's just been a really neat journey. And this is a time when we can embrace that creativity in education. So if we go back a few years, um, I grew up in Wisconsin. I have a degree in elementary education from a university there, and I actually started um, a master's in reading while I was doing my undergrad. I've always been interested in how kids learn to read, and I remember going to some of my initial classes, and the professional teachers who were there to continue their education, they would talk amongst themselves, and they'd say, you know, I've got this child who keeps reversing his B's and his D's, and I remember just kind of observing that and going, huh, these are professional teachers who are continuing in a master's in reading and they, they're kind of puzzling about some of these things. So I thought, okay, well, you know, I'm going to be a newbie teacher. And 
So I ended up taking my first teaching job at a little private classical school in St. Louis. I taught fourth grade and I was the sole fourth grade teacher. It was just the tiniest, sweetest little school. And because it was so small, it didn't have any accommodations or services for students who learn differently. So one student came through my class that puzzled me and my husband. My husband was also an educator at this school as well. He had the same student. And this, this boy was really bright. He was gifted athletically. And yet when it came to reading aloud, which we did a lot of, it was very literature rich, he really stumbled over his words. And it was very laborious and almost painful for this sweet little boy to read. And then his spelling and his handwriting just never really improved. And as a school, we really prided ourselves on spelling and on phonics because the school had recently adopted an Orton-Gillingham-based program. Now, it's not a very well-known one, um, and it has some excellent principles, but it wasn't really meeting the need of this particular student. And it was kind of a sad thing, Nicole, because we wanted to keep him as a student, but he couldn't stay. And so I think he ended up going into the public school system. And he's the one child, well, among many, that I think many educators will look back and say, oh, if I only could have helped that student. I, I remember him very much. After that, Nicole, um, well, not after that, I met a family there at the classical school that wanted the flexibility of homeschooling. They wanted to travel and ride horses, but mom didn't want to be the educator. And so because we had become friendly, they said, Erin, would you teach our two daughters at home? And this family was just a lovely family. They were entrepreneurs, just a really fun family. And I said, yes, this sounds like my dream job. And so for three years, I was their teacher at home for these two sweet little girls. Going into it, I knew that the younger daughter who would have been going into third grade at the time, I knew she struggled with reading. She was great at math though. They called her the math queen at school. <laughs> and so going into it, I thought, okay, well, now we can be one-on-one -on -one with instruction. We're really going to cruise and make a lot of progress in reading. And homeschool was a great situation for her. It took away the anxiety of the classroom the fast pace of the classroom, and we could do things on her time and in her way. Well, I found that my teaching just wasn't, wasn't what she needed. You know, I was pulling out all the tricks I knew, you know, from my teaching background, from the classical school, and it just wasn't, we just weren't getting anywhere. And I remember even one time I was having her look up something in the dictionary, and she crawled under the table because she just couldn't bear to look at things in the dictionary, just couldn't do it. And I did not understand. So eventually we got to a point where she was tested by a local psychologist and the diagnosis was dyslexia. And as I started researching, the light bulb went on. Everything started to make a lot more sense for me regarding this little girl I was teaching but also that young boy that I had taught at the classical school and looking back, I could almost guarantee that he had dyslexia as well. And I just didn't know. I just wasn't prepared as a teacher. Right. So the psychologist recommended the Barton reading and spelling system. And I said, I want to learn that. I want to be her tutor as well as continue all of her subjects. So we got that set up. We began the instruction, and it was just the piece of the puzzle that was missing. You know, we started making progress in reading and spelling, and her confidence grew, and it was just such an exciting time. So I worked for that family for three years, and then my husband and I moved to the Nashville area, where we are now. And I didn't know what I was going to do for a job when I moved here, and so praying about it. And... I find this ad on Craigslist for someone else who needs a home teacher. Wow. I didn't know there were other families out there, Nicole, who were looking for home teachers. You know, this is maybe seven years ago now, you know, well before this pandemic and people have started looking for home teachers now. Uh, so I responded to the ad and it was a retired um, Titans player and his family. And they wanted the freedom of homeschooling again. 
but mom didn't want to teach. And so they hired me to teach their daughter. And a lot, she did not have any learning differences. So it was just an opportunity to really enrich a child at home and give her the freedom to travel and to bake cookies and play with her cats and all those fun things she loved. Along the way, though, I continued tutoring for dyslexia. There were many students who needed help one-on-one -on -one after school or um, on weekends, and I became certified in the Barton system. Now, I worked for one more family after this second one. And this third family, the son also had dyslexia. And so I put to use the things I had been learning. And then I went back to the classroom for two years um, for, with, at a private school um, in this area. And I taught second grade. And it was, I'm so glad I did. I'm so glad to have come full circle after starting in the classroom, gone to private school. I, I should say I started in public school then went into private school, then homeschool, and then back into a school. And Nicole, I, I enjoyed it. I loved having a classroom and working with families, but I felt that I could make a greater difference by uh, tutoring full-time, one-on-one. -on -one. And so two years ago, my husband and I opened the Nashville Dyslexia Center, and we solely provide tutoring individually for students with dyslexia or suspected dyslexia. So it's been a long journey, um, but this is finally the place where I feel like I'm making the greatest impact. And so I want to encourage families out there that are looking at different kinds of education to be creative. You know, think about what your child needs and what suits them best and try it. And what works for a couple of years or a year might not be the thing they need in a year or two. She might, he or she might need something different, but there are lots of different opportunities for education today. Absolutely. And you know, what I love about what you shared with us is, you know, families do look different and individual situations look different. And it's, it's interesting that, you know, some of your first experiences with being the private teacher or the home teacher is it was several years ago, right? And so now, you know, as we see our students returning back to school after five to six months of a break of in-person instruction, there is, it's really a unique time because we're able to see just all the creativity that's going into not only school schedules, the layout of the building, uh, what's best for students, how do they learn best, and more than ever, I believe families are even more involved with those educational decisions. It's not I just sign up and my child comes to school, you know, um, we, we live in the Atlanta area, and many of our public schools are giving options. Do you want to go hybrid? Do you, you know, some are going completely online for the first six to nine weeks. So I love the couple of things, because what we know about dyslexia, right, is that it's very individualized, like every child looks a little different with their strengths, and they look a little different with the level, I guess, I don't know if level is the right word, but to say if they're mild or moderate or severe dyslexic, or they may have other things, uh, you know, uh, articulation or ADHD. So every child, as we know, in general, are very unique, but even that other layer of dyslexia and the strengths that they have really gives us the opportunity to look outside the box and I think more and more families are doing that. So I'm so excited to have you share your journey with us today. And I heard a few things, but I want to dig a little deeper when we think about, because I think even as families listen to this, it's August. So they've probably made a preliminary decision on this is what our school year is currently going to look like. But as we know, <laughs> last year, uh, that changed in 24 hours, at least in Georgia. So I want families to be thinking about, you know, it's not always too late, you know, and it may even be something you work on the next six to 12 months. But I know that it just may look different. So as, as I dig a little deeper with you about the, the benefits of having a teacher come to your home, have a private teacher, you know, what are some of the benefits that you've seen for those students? Erin, I was thinking about too, as I was thinking about that, picture you posted of you and the child on the swing and she, I think she's crocheting or knitting or something and then you're reading and so that's what my, is that the picture in my mind when I ask you you know what are some of the other benefits from teaching at home and specifically the parents I can tell you from from our background we are educators in our home 
but I don't want to teach my fourth grader. Like that's, that has been a clash for us because we do have very strong personalities, me and my daughter. And so she responds better to a teacher. So for us, even I could see the attraction of having a private teacher or someone else to be the primary facilitator if we end up back at home again. So I was curious if you could share some of those benefits you've seen firsthand of being in homes with families. Yes. I found that homeschooling is extremely efficient. So if you think about a school day, you have the time it takes to get to the child's classroom. You might have assemblies, you have bathroom breaks, you have all kinds of little things that take up quite a lot of time during the school day. And it's not necessarily that they're bad things, but with homeschooling or learning at home online, however you want to look at it, you're extremely efficient. You hop on the computer, you do your assignments, you're done. Um, Or if you are mom homeschooling your children, or if you hire a teacher to come in, you, you choose the subjects that are most important to your family. You get straight to work, the child finishes their assignment, and you have actually a lot of free time during the day. And I think one benefit of that is your child is not so worn out. Uh, The school day can be very long, and especially for our students that learn a little bit differently, they are working at 110% all day long. And so, I mean, parents, I'm sure you've seen this, where your child comes home and they've held it together all day at school, and they just have a meltdown after school. And so learning at home can really take away a lot of the physical stress that they're under but also the mental and emotional stress that they're under. When you learn at home, it's a private situation. The only people that are going to hear your child read aloud are you, maybe another parent, and a sibling. Their peers aren't around to hear them make mistakes. And so they become much more secure at home. They become much more confident, and they're willing to try. And so I have found for the students that I've taught, at least, who have been in school before, that coming home just relieves a lot of anxiety for that child and for the parent then, too. If their child's stress level comes down, then theirs does, too, because they're not so worried about them. Um, I would say, too, Nicole, learning at home, you can choose the pacing for your child, And so some of our um, dyslexic students, they might be really gifted at math. And so they're able to do two math lessons in one setting because they just love it so much or they just understand it. And they might be a year or two ahead in math after some time. Now, you might need to slow down on some things. You might need to, with their reading or their literature, you might need to slow down a little bit and go at their pace. And that's perfectly fine. We are not one size fits all people. You know, when we finish school, we go off to do different things according to our interests. And homeschooling really allows students to go at their pace. And I love that because as I think about last year, and I'm not criticizing educators, I live with an educator, absolutely they did phenomenal in in what they had to do in a 24 hour period. But now we have had a minute, right. For them to think through things. But I know, you know, as I, as I think through, and I know families that are in similar situations, learning at home, it, to me, it becomes very attractive because last year it was still, we're going to be on the same school schedule. We're going to get all the subjects in, we're going to do all the work and working, having two full-time working parents, even though we were in the home, we were still had work obligations. It was very difficult and it did feel um, quite challenging some days. And so I love that you said, you know, the beauty of learning at home. And, and let me be clear here, when we're talking about this, we are talking about homeschooling where you and the educator that's working with you are making decisions as opposed to your school is just online and you've got someone in your home helping you just facilitate your day. I think that's very different because that does, the, the first one does give you the autonomy to really choose the subjects like you said uh, and really think through, you know, what's what's going to, to, to go toward their strengths and, and then what days, you know, it, it may be today's not a good day. And so maybe today we do less math because that's their weakness or maybe that's their strength. And so, okay, well, we'll do two math lessons and maybe not do as much of 
whatever else it might be. And so I learned during the, the time we were home last year, I just had to make some of those decisions as a parent, even though it was pushing a little bit with the school, I just said, this is what we can get done, right? But I do think that's a huge benefit. The pacing is a huge benefit, the self-confidence and the really, you know, you as a family thinking with your child, if they're old enough to do that about pacing and what that looks like. And then if, if you're blessed to have an educator come work with you directly in your home, you can really have some strong conversations about what does this need to look like? And like for us, by the time we would get to Friday, we were pretty much done. Like I wasn't getting much work out of So by noon, I was like, okay, we're just done. And I learned that after many, many weeks of just <laughs> lots of struggles, let me just say it that way. I think though, as I think, you know, through that other options and scenarios, though, I do think about one of the things that was a downfall last year and that wasn't anybody's fault it was because we were we we were and are literally in a pandemic which is the social interaction so how did the families that you work with also still provide the opportunity for their child to put to the social emotional piece because they are focused at home there there is not a classroom full of students with them right which can be a benefit but how do they i guess fill that gap and provide that other piece i think i know what that is but i'd love to hear from you as to how the families did that yes oh, that's a great question and the question of socialization is a common one that i've heard from many parents you know they say doesn't my child need to be you know around a lot of other children in order to develop the social skills and I say this and I, I mean, no, nothing funny or nothing, um, nothing negative about this, but I don't know that schools are necessarily the place that a child has to be socialized. And I think back to my own school experience, I don't think it's the job of schools necessarily to provide socialization. So the families I worked for, they involved their children at church. They took riding lessons with other children and horse competitions. They participated in sports and they even participated in sports with the local school district because here in Tennessee, if you're homeschooled, you can still participate in after school sports in your district. And so they would join things that they would join activities that fit their schedule, that fit their budget, their time frame, and the things that they were interested in at the time. And what we found, too, is if we go back to the, um, you mentioned the story of the girl on the swing crocheting while I read aloud to her. Well, what we actually did is we brought someone in to teach crocheting. And she was a lovely grandmother. And we had a lovely relationship with her, getting to know her as she taught the student this skill of crocheting. So socialization doesn't necessarily need to be with children your child's own age. In fact, it's a really good idea to teach your child to interact with people of all ages, all backgrounds, all abilities. That's what's going to make a well-rounded child. And whether or not your student goes back into the classroom, those are rich life skills that they really need to have. And homeschooling might be the opportunity to really develop them. And you can train your child in what you think are the best ways to socialize with others. And I love that. And I, and I love the part of really thinking, and we, I talk a, a good bit about this too, is that really figuring out where their gifts are, right? We all have strengths. And so we need to remember for the dyslexic to really give a lot to that because there's so much other pieces that they feel inadequate, maybe too strong of a word, but maybe they start there. Uh, so I love the idea of no matter what your school situation looks like, finding those similar interests. So if your child's interested in soccer or they're interested in crocheting or whatever it might be, getting them also to have the opportunities to work with, you know, work with other students or other adults who also love that and can share such valuable pieces. And then they have that commonality, right? Because you may sit next to someone in fourth grade, but you may have nothing in common. And so what a wonderful way to, to also share each other's gifts. And so I love that. That's, that's great. So you talked a little bit about even when you moved, you know, states that, you know, I would, let me just say on the side, I would have never thought to look on Craigslist, but hey, who knows, right? <laughs> so <laughs> that was a good segue though for the next piece, which is, you know, obviously you and I live in different states, but if parents are listening, if moms are listening and thinking, you know, I'm a little curious about this, maybe this is a direction where would someone go to find a qualified teacher? And the other piece of that is I loved that 
you are so open to learning yourself. Cause I think those of us that are great teachers are lifelong teachers, right? We're always wanting to learn more. We're always looking for other avenues to better ourselves and better what we know. But I also think about, is that overwhelming to a parent to think, okay, I've got to find a teacher, but then I also need to find someone who, who understands and can work with my dyslexic child or willing to learn that. So what, what, I mean, what advice would you give to moms that are thinking, Hmm, this is curious. Maybe this is the direction I want to go because I'm just not satisfied with where we are, or maybe it's just, I'm going to tuck this in the back of my mind and start kind of thinking about this may be an option in the next 12 months or so, or the next 12 weeks, who knows? (laughs) So could you share a little bit of advice as to how would, how do I go about finding that teacher for my, for my family? I think it's important to realize when you need help. And that's what you're saying is sometimes families do need outside help for their students. And so I found my jobs mostly through relationships, through the private school I was working at, through word of mouth for the third family, and then Craigslist of all places for the second family. And looking back on it, Nicole, that family and I, we laugh about it because they're very private and they go, we can't believe we put something out on Craigslist. And I said, I can't believe you did either. (laughs) So we found found each other. It was meant to be. But I've had actually a couple of moms ask me that very same question recently. And I think you need to cast a wide net when you are looking for a teacher to come to your home, whether it's full-time teaching every subject or just a subject or two. So put it up on your social media that you are looking, put it up in the mom's Facebook groups or on Instagram. Those are the ones that we think of doing. But I also think if you're involved in a church or in a social group, ask Mm -hmm. people there, ask if it'd be okay to make an announcement on Sunday um, or stop by the Sunday school section and ask the teachers there, you know, is there anybody here with a teaching background that might be interested in helping me educate my children at home. And I think you might be surprised that there might be retired teachers who are interested in this kind of work. There may be recent college graduates who haven't found the right full-time position. So that's another idea is checking with your local college or university um, for students who might have just finished their degree and are qualified to help you at home. And so I think if you start early, and you cast that wide net, you will find somebody that will fit your family really well. And I don't know about in Georgia, but here in Nashville, I'm hearing a lot about what they're calling learning pods. Here too. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think this is such an intriguing idea. You partner with another family in your neighborhood or maybe a couple or in your general area and you share teaching duties or you all meet at one person's home. It would really look like whatever that group decided it wanted to look like. And I think that's a a fascinating idea, too, because maybe there's a mom there who has a teaching background, but she doesn't want to take on every single teaching duty every day, but you could share some of those things. And so it really is, you know, how can we think creatively about this? And, you know, how can we think outside the box to find that right fit for our child? And I think it's out there. I really do. And I think, too, the more and more I kind of watch uh, around us as well, I noticed that um, I have family that also teaches in Mississippi And, you know, it's interesting to see how different states are responding to the pandemic, but it's also interesting to see what the different school options look like. And I think even more now, there may be a a, more of a job pool because I think teachers are looking for other ways they can make a make an impact, but they don't necessarily feel comfortable being back in the classroom. You know, because as they think about managing, I know some of the schools here, teachers are having to manage teaching you know, in the classroom a couple of times a week. And then the other days of the week, the students are at home. And so they're supposed to give instruction there too. And then, so it's just like, there's lots of different ways they're having to do it and they're having to do it all at the same time. And so for, I can't, you mentioned first year teachers. I can't even imagine uh, being a first year teacher this year, bless their hearts. And so I think more than ever, I think we, we, I love the idea of casting a large net, but I also think there may be more fish out there, right? So to speak, because people are looking for alternatives and it's not necessarily that maybe a family is, I mean, maybe it is, is unhappy with the school their child is at, 
but maybe for medical reasons or health reasons or just none of us really know what this is all going to look like when it's said and done. I love the other day, someone said, um, I don't think about this as my new normal, which is what a lot of us say, but the person said, I think about this as the future, the, the next future or something like that. And I thought that's such a unique way to look at things because although we're all trying to make the best educated decision, we really just don't know. Right. And so I think for some people, I don't want to say it's out of fear, but out of, you know, when, when my child's in my home, I know what that looks like. And so I can just see even more families looking at maybe even not a traditional homeschool, but what does it look like to educate from home? What does it look like to learn from home? And like you said, you know, even if it is that they're using the, the full-time model at school and they're having a private tutor work with their child or whatever that might look like, that good combination. So I think you perfectly said it earlier, which is, again, you know, it's just some decisions families have to make as to what is best for their child, what's going to work best for them. I know a coworker of mine here in Atlanta, their school is 100% virtual. And she's like, my husband and I have to work full time. So we have hired someone to come in our home and help. And so I don't know if that's a tutor or facilitator, an educator. I didn't ask a lot of questions, but people are already going and making those decisions even more now than maybe seven, eight, 10 years ago. Maybe those were people in very different situations, but I think now people are looking at it as, this is a real option and maybe we should really consider this and, and it might make a mom feel more comfortable to know, you know, the students just down the hall, if I need to walk down there and check on them, as opposed to I send them to school, did they take their mask off? Did they wear their mask? Did the teacher take something off? Did they take a school picture? Are there too many kids in the hallway? I mean, these are all the things we're seeing on social media that everybody has an opinion about. So I just think that it's, uh, I, I just think it's a wonderful opportunity and conversation to be having. So I, I appreciate you being the one to have it with me. So it's, it's great. I, I appreciate it. You used the word opportunity just a minute ago. And I think that is really key here. Things are changing, but it's creating more choice for parents. Maybe not a choice that they wanted to make. They're being forced to make, but with more choices will come, I think, teachers and schools who become more specialized. I think online education is only going to get better. I think families who choose homeschooling are really going to rejoice in that situation and grow better into that. And so I think in the long run, all of these choices are going to be a benefit for our students and are going to help them are we going to have growing pains right now? Absolutely. School has already started here in Middle Tennessee, and there have been some major hiccups along the way. But I also think, Nicole, I have high hopes for this generation of children. I think that they are going to grow up and learn to be more flexible, more resilient. Um, I think that they can be very hardworking as a result of all of these things, and maybe more independent, especially for those of them who are at home learning online, maybe a little bit more independently. So there, I think there are some positives that are going to come out of this, but it's going to take a little bit to work through all of that. And I think as parents and educators, we need to keep a really positive attitude for these children. It is so important to walk into that classroom or start the homeschool day positively. These children have no control over these things, and we don't want to increase their anxiety. We want to give them opportunity and laugh about when things go wrong. And when you have a hard day, you have a hard day. But we want to go in and say, you know what? This is what's going on right now. We're going to make the best of it. And so let's do that. Let's go forward together and really try. And I think, too, you've got to give yourself some grace as a mom because I think last year, at least I can speak for myself, I'm very type A. So I had a schedule and we were going to do this, this, and this. And, you know, and, and then too, I think I was naive thinking, oh, it'll just be a week. Oh, it'll just be two weeks. <laughs> and then like 12 weeks in, I'm like, oh, I guess we're doing this thing. So, you know, I think, but I did learn along the way to really watch my daughter, right? And there were some days when I was like, you know what, we, we've, we've done for today. This is, this is, we're, we're just done. We're going to take a break. We're going to do some other fun stuff. And, you know, and, and I had to be okay with, I had to give myself a little space to be okay with, okay, you weren't able to check all today's boxes off. And that's okay, because the school was giving you what they thought you needed to provide all the resources. And so maybe that day we didn't get to the extra social studies lesson or whatever it might have been. 
because you really just have to pay attention to what's going on. And there were days I got it wrong. Absolutely. There were days when we had meltdowns and I was like, okay, so I tried to do it all and it's just not possible. So I think as moms, we have to also, I, I agree. I think it's a, it's going to be very interesting to see what this generation of students look like 10, 20 years from now. But for right now, I think we also have to give ourselves some space to be okay with not getting it right or to walk in the other room and take some deep breaths and say, okay, are we okay stopping where we are? Do we just need to take a 20 minute break? What is it that I need to do next? And so I think in those situations, you just, you just have to roll with it and just know that you're, you've got your, your students and your child's best interest at heart, but sometimes it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to give yourself some space and some grace because we're not going to get it right every day. Well, and that's I'll okay. tell you a little secret, Nicole. Classroom teachers have the exact same experience. We have rock star days where everything is done. The lessons are taught to the minute and kids are acing things. And then we have really hard days too, where you need to walk down to the teacher's lounge and get a cup of coffee and just take right. a minute. It's the same yeah. thing because we're people, you know, we are real people with real emotions and we just, we, this is our experience. We go forward together. That's right. Well, before I let you go today, um, can you, can you tell us a little bit about maybe a favorite story that you may have, maybe a favorite student story about dyslexia or maybe a, a favorite, something that you've been through as far as your dyslexia journey and working with students that you'd like to share? I would like to share actually a little bit about the services that we offer because they have changed. And I think that parents need to hear a little bit about some of the options for students with dyslexia. I started my business with in-person tutoring. And we actually don't have a physical location. And so I and my tutors travel to public, excuse me, travel to private schools, to students' homes, to libraries, really wherever we can meet students and get the job done. And that's a wonderful arrangement. Now it has its limitations, um, geography. We have to have a tutor available in a certain location in order to provide services. Um, we have to have a time slot open and so on and so forth. Now online tutoring has always been an option for my business. I didn't pursue it until I had to when the pandemic hit. And right. so at first I was a little resistant to it, but it was the wise decision. And now I am so glad that we tried it. And most of, so we transitioned every single one of our students to online dyslexia tutoring. They continue to work with their same tutor one-on-one -on -one for their sessions. And it's gone beautifully. We, we did not miss one session as a practice when the pandemic hit because we all went online so nicely. And most of our students have remained online and opted for that. And I think there's a couple reasons for that. One, it provides a stable educational experience. We're not in person one day and then, oh, we've got COVID. And so now we've got to transition online. So it's very right. predictable. It's very stable. We teach the exact same lesson online that we would have taught in person. Everything is exactly the same. And so we use Zoom and a platform called Wizimo. And I know parents are going to go, oh no, not Zoom again. <laughs> and I, I get it. <laughs> we are all Zoomed out at some point. However, it's a little different with private tutoring. There's one other person on the screen and that's your child's tutor. And they are face to face. They are interacting the entire time. And it's very, very, um, it's very, well, to use the word interactive again, um, and it doesn't feel like the mass Zoom call that you might have at school when they're trying to do online schooling. And so students, they love it. You know, they kind of feel like they're playing a game when they're on the computer and moving the little letter tiles. They're so comfortable in that world anyway. Oh, they are. They are. Absolutely. And online tutoring can open parents' schedules up. And so, you know, you can meet with your tutor before the school day. And, and do that. And it makes rescheduling lessons so much easier. So we've talked a lot today about different educational settings. And I think that there's something out there for any parent. Um, and so as we go forward as a dyslexia tutoring practice, we're going to continue with the online model. You know, we can have a greater reach, a greater impact, I believe. Um, and we can serve students anywhere. 
we can serve students outside of Nashville. Um, and so we'd be happy to do that. So I want to encourage parents, you, you have opportunities and options. Um, I think it's actually a very exciting time. And I, th I think it's going to be good for our students. Great. Well, remind uh, the listeners where they can find you. So I am the owner of Nashville Dyslexia Center. Our website is NashvilleDyslexiaCenter.com. I have social media pages on Facebook. You can just go to Nashville Dyslexia Center. And then Instagram is Nashville underscore dyslexia. So I'd love to meet your, your audience online. That would be great. And I love, I, I love to follow you on both, but uh, Instagram, I've kind of migrated to you lately trying to grow myself and I love all the things and I love all the examples and it's just wonderful. So please go follow Erin and, and the Nashville Dyslexia Center because it's, it's amazing. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed talking with you today and I've enjoyed learning more about homeschooling options and just options in general and learning more about your business. And I love uh, the idea of, you know, we can still do this even if it is over a digital medium because kids are digital natives. And so they're, they jump right in and they're good to go. It's us that we have to figure out where's the Zoom code and all that kind of good stuff. But kids are very, like you said, very resilient. And so they will, will do well with that as well. So thank you so much for being here today and sharing your thoughts and sharing your time with us. It is my pleasure. Thank you so much, Nicole. I'd love to hear what you think about the podcast. So head over to iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast and leave a review. And I might just give you a shout out on the next podcast. So tune in for our bonus episodes. We're going to have some bonuses this, this month. And on Monday, we will have another special guest for you on our back to school mini series that you don't want to miss. Uh, have I mentioned that you need to subscribe? Maybe not, but I'm doing it again. So subscribe to the podcast so you won't miss any of the episodes. Seriously, you're going to want to listen wherever you listen to your podcast. And hey, just remember, you got this. Go enjoy your day.